afternoon. It's Friday the 2nd of June 2017, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Mike Robinson, with me in the studio, Patrick Henningsen. Uh, and we have uh, quite a number of guests today, uh, but we're going to start off uh, with Mark Anderson uh, and say uh, straight away, welcome to the programme, Mark. Uh, and of course, you are uh, at Chantilly uh, to, well, to see what's going on with regard to Bilderberg. Uh, give us an update. They started rolling in yesterday, uh, Mike and Patrick. Uh, Christine Lagarde, just before 7 p.m. local time roll in. Of course, she's the longtime head of the International Monetary Fund. What's notable this year is there's no less than 15 members of the press here, uh, media outlets, mostly from Italy, Spain, uh, Norway. Uh, it's not just John Micklethwaite of Bloomberg, and it's not just The Economist, uh, and it's not just Pe Peggy Nugan of The Wall Street Journal, or Noonan, rather. But it's about 15 members out of 131 attendees. We've got about 11 or 12 percent media here uh, inside the Bilderberg meeting, not reporting on it, whereas normally we'd have maybe 5 percent media. So the media representation here who are not reporting to their public but are participating has tripled for this year. That's one very notable thing. Another notable thing is the head of CERN, the super collider is here, uh, the, the man that runs that out of Switzerland. Uh, that's rather unusual. And uh, media coverage in terms of mainstream media, a quick note, is virtually non-existent. The Washington Post at least acknowledged Bilderberg five years ago, the last time they met here in Chantilly, Virginia. But the uh, Trump's decision, apparent decision, to pull out of the Paris Accord is overshadowing everything. And the internationalist, neoliberal, monopoly capitalist Bilderberg press is going ape, you know what, going crazy over Trump's apparent decisions. So that's all they're talking about is the Paris Climate Accord over right. so-called climate right. change. So, so we're gonna talk about that in a second, Mark, but uh, do you think that the change in personnel is in any way uh, uh, indicating a change of role for Bilderberg? Well, certainly we have to look at the wake of the very recent death, May 26th of Zbigniew Brzezinski, a Bilderberger also connected to one of the spokes to Bilderberg's hub, and that's the Trilateral Commission that he helped found with David Rockefeller, who also passed away in March. So you have the old guard beginning to pass away of the internationalist provenance establishment, and now Henry Kissinger has got to be hanging by the proverbial thread. One of the jokes around here is when an ambulance goes in or out of the Chantilly Hotel here where Bilderberg is meeting, that that's Kissinger's limo, the ambulance, that's an inside joke here. But uh, anyway, uh, that's a very open, but it's certainly highly likely with the new membership, the new people coming on board, the head of CERN. Uh, you have George Osborne listed here now as the London Evening Standard editor. And I believe that's the uh, George Osborne that's a friend of yours and mine, the former chancellor of the of the Exchequer in Britain. Now he's listed as one of the 15 or so media members. Um, um, it, it's, it's, there's some new twists and turns like that. And the uh, exact answer to that question is one I'll be exploring more over the weekend, talking to uh, people on the inside of Bilderberg, if at all possible, and talking to others that are coming here, see what their thoughts are, and to see if uh, some of these people passing away and some of the new people, does this represent a changing of the guard? Does it mean a divergence or a, a, a sharp turn or any kind of change in the Bilderberg agenda? That's hard to say precisely, but I would say tentatively, um, the answer is very likely yes. Okay, any thoughts? Uh, and what about the uh, the Young Turks, the, the high-tech component of Bilderberg this year, Mark? Uh, I see Peter Thiel, Eric Schmidt, head of Alphabet, Peter Thiel, uh, uh, Clarion Capital, and Rubenstein, Palantir, uh, represented. Um, they seem to be uh, taking a more prominent role uh, in the steering committees and so forth. What are you hearing about that side of things? Hearing about that side of things. Well, then there's Alex Karp, too. Um, <clears throat> what, I've, what I've heard last year and this year, actually going back to 2015 in Austria, when that was becoming more prevalent then, is that this represents the focus on uh, you know, sequestering more information through alphabet and mo uh, more of the uh, connivance between um, people like Eric Schmidt and these high-tech attendees with intelligence people that come to Bilderberg former and current intelligence people. We have Mr. Cohen 
a former assistant director of the CIA who's here this year. You have this collaboration between former and current Intel people and your Facebook people, your Google people, your Alex Karps. And the concern is that through artificial intelligence, surveillance technology, there'll be more insider trading between Intel people and people that work in the information technology um, uh, realm that you're talking about, Patrick. And the suspicion, and I think it's a, it's a valid one, is that there's a lot of insider collaboration going on to get these high tech companies to uh, share more data with the government uh, for surveillance purposes and to strike deals. Uh, just like Michael Meacher said back in 2013 when Bilderberg met, Bilderberg is partially a deal making conference. It's not just a world planning committee that's off the grid to chart the basic economic and political and cultural destiny of the world. It's also a deal making conference. So that's that's the general fear and it's it's reaching a more of a fever pitch this year. Okay, Mark, thank you very much for that report. Now, of course, uh, you did mention a second ago that uh, uh, Donald Trump has uh, withdrawn from the Paris Climate Agreement and the media going absolutely nuts. Uh, and here is the independent. Uh, Donald Trump might be the dimmest president the US has ever had. had. Patrick, they've got a short memory. Surely George W. Bush is the dimmest, but... People do have a short memory. It is amazing, yeah. Uh, so, you know, George W. Bush seems to have not have traveled outside of the continental United States uh, before he became president. But uh, so Trump is slightly more worldly. But yeah, they're up in arms over the fact the uh, U.S. seems to be withdrawing from the Paris Agreement. Uh, and what's interesting is when you listen to Barack Obama, for instance, he had a quote, he said, now the U.S. is joining a handful of nations. Uh, so basically trying to create this image of a handful of nations versus the rest of the world. But the United States itself is bigger than 100 handfuls. Yeah, we'll, we'll come so, on to that. So, we will yeah. come on to that in a second. So, so uh, EU leaders uh, warning Trump. So the EU now feels it can start warning the president of the United States. That's good. Glad to see that. Uh, EU was, uh, leaders warned Trump the Paris climate deal can't be renegotiated. So Trump seems to be taking a leaf out of uh, the, the British book, uh, attempting to renegotiate things uh, after they've happened or whatever. Uh, but uh, the media just full of this stuff. So we now have animations appearing 100 years of global warming in less than a minute. We've got to make sure that despite Trump's decision, don't uh, wonder why he's made that decision. Keep keep uh, keep following the, the rhetoric. Uh, here's what you were talking about. Sean Spicer pushed this out. Uh, it's a quote from Trump saying, I was elected by voters of Pittsburgh, not Paris. I promised a wild exit or re renegotiate any deal uh, which fails to serve US interests. Uh, and uh, well, <laughs> the responses, fact, Hillary Clinton received 80% of the vote in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh stands with the world and will follow the Paris Agreement. Uh, and we get a clue here as to what, uh, as the kind of response that we're gonna see. Uh, this is the same guy, Bill Peduto, saying, uh, as the mayor of Pittsburgh, I can assure you that we will follow the guidelines of the Paris Agreement for our people, our economy and our future. Uh, and he said, United States joined Syria, Nicaragua and Russia in deciding not to participate in the world's Paris Agreement. Uh, it's now up to cities to lead. And here we get the clue of what's coming next. Uh, and this was the uh, mayor of Paris saying, regardless of Donald Trump's decision, the great cities of the world remain resolutely committed to doing what needs to be done to implement the Paris Agreement. So what we're seeing is, is this being used as an excuse for, for, to push through uh, a form of alternative governance. It, we're, we're not going to have national governments anymore. It's going to be city-based. City, it's the city, the city state agenda, the smart cities, strong cities, resilient cities. We're back to this theme again. Uh, absolutely. But what it does, Mike, here is this accentuates the uh, the difference politically between uh, urban and rural. And this was a, this definitely, if you look at the demographics of the Hillary Clinton campaign, and it was really going along those lines. So city, I live in the city, so therefore I'm more relevant. And uh, you know, people who live outside of the city are not as relevant, and their voice is not counted uh, at the same uh, level. So th this is uh, exactly what this is shaping up. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so Anne Hilda Hildago, who's the uh, mayor of uh, Paris, was writing in Newsweek this morning, saying Donald Trump has made a dramatic and unpopular mistake in leaving the Paris Agreement. Of course, uh, the 
uh, sort of image for the video is uh, of the polar bear. That's got to be the case. Uh, she said that we deem the momentum generated in Paris in December 2015 irreversible. And we firmly believe that the Paris Agreement cannot be renegotiated since it's a vital instrument for our planet, societies and economies. And of course, this is all linked in with the uh, Agenda 2030 uh, development goals. Uh, and uh, just to reinforce that then, of course, she also heads up uh, C40 Cities, uh, which is uh, the think tank which is promoting uh, city-based governance. Uh, and, and of course, she also heads up Women for Climate. But let's just... Uh, remember who else is involved in this this idea this momentum towards city-based uh, governance ken livingston devolve part of your cities if you want to save the planet join the global parliament of mayors and here's the mayor of the hague saying the global parliament of mayors will deploy collective urban political power manifesting the right of cities to govern themselves as well as the responsibility to enact viable cross-border solutions to global challenges in this era of interdependence where nation states are increasingly dysfunctional and cities are everywhere rising, uh, the moment has come for cities to take the leap from effective local governance to true global governance. Um, so anybody wants to see a bit of the background to this, uh, have a look at the uh, article on the UK Column website, the Global Parliament of Mayors and the Abolition of the Electorate. Uh, the first sitting of the Global Parliament of Mayors was uh, at the end of last year, October, November time. And uh, by the way, in America, this track has already been laid down during the election cycle over the immigration issue and the issue of sanctuary cities. So mayors like uh, Bill de Blasio and Rahm Emanuel in Chicago coming forward and saying, we're not going to abide by federal immigration laws. We're going to keep our cities as sanctuaries for uh, undocumented or illegal uh, immigrants. And uh, we're not going to basically follow any uh, uh, federal laws or any laws passed by the sovereign uh, government body uh, in Washington, D.C. So again, it's cities first, uh, nation states secondary. But what, what's interesting, Mike, is they want to have their cake and eat it too. Uh, the, the global warming on one hand, and then it's climate on the other. Yeah. So which is it? And I, I think if uh, the current climate trends continue towards cooling, you're going to see more polar bears, uh, perhaps in Scotland, south of the Arctic in, Circle, in, maybe down in, in Scotland, in which David's is David's neck of the woods. Yes, a perfect opportunity to bring David in at this point. Welcome, David Scott, to the program. Uh, any thoughts on what we've just covered? Well, well, you can't move for pandas at the moment in Scotland. Polar bears are thankfully not that common, but it could come. Um, Trump's decision being unpopular, yes. Unpopular with whom is the question? Certainly not with the people who voted for him, not with the minors that he had in the, in the White House not so long ago. Um, and all these uh, references to we need uh, the, the, the um, global warming agenda for our economy. No, no, no. The economy does quite well with people acting in their own interests. If um, the, the um, low carbon economy actually was beneficial to human thriving, you wouldn't need to uh, incentivize its introduction by way of um, regulation and uh, penal levels of taxation. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, well, Patrick, the uh, Hillary has launched into a tirade on Trump now. She has. So really, I think Hillary's doing a kind of a whistle stop, uh, whistle stop tour right now, uh, promoting herself and her book and so forth. So bl blaming everybody and anything uh, still for the election loss, uh, except uh, maybe herself or things that she hasn't done. But uh, all kinds of conspiracy claims coming out now about what uh, Trump did, what Macedonian teenagers did. It, it's, it is staggering because we used to be the conspiracy theorists and now she's talking about a thousand Russian agents. Yeah. What is going on? Yeah, no, it, it, if you read this, this article is just basically a wrap up of uh, everything that she said during this uh, well-publicized speech recently, but uh, it's it's stunning. I mean, it's in the mail, of course, the mail yeah. online. Um, not, not my favorite publication, but uh, it's a good wrap up. Um, and she's got, He's blaming everybody from uh, the Russians to ISIS to uh, the, who knows, the Republican Party, uh, blaming Obama um, because uh, he had it easier apparently because he was a good looking male, she said. Um, even though he was the first black president, is because he was so good looking that somehow people were discriminating against her because she's an older lady. So, really, she's having swings at just about everybody. Right. Okay. So. Okay. And uh, well, here's uh, Donald 
uh, again with his hand on the orb in Riyadh. Uh, and this just as before we leave, Donald Trump will cover this after the Riyadh summit. Sunni unity is crumbling. Yeah. We have some quotes from this article. Um, so uh, you wouldn't need theatrics in Riyadh if there was actual substance between, behind the 55 nation summit to fight terror. The cracks started emerging immediately with a very public Saudi UAE Qatari spat. But dig deeper and you discover the vaunted Sunni, Sunni alliance has no glue hold it, to hold it together. The meeting was to serve US and Saudi political interests only. And the goal was to frame new narratives to target old enemies. If we collectively seek to thwart ter terror, then we collectively have to fight it. There are no sides in this battle. That wasn't actually in the article, but that's an excerpt from the author, right. Shamin Orwani. This is a great article. This is one of the best uh, uh, articles on this subject I've seen. And so what's going, what's going on here is, is amazing. So this, we, this idea of Sunni unity, this is an idea that's being pushed constantly uh, by the United States and by the U.S. mainstream media and also being used as a pretext to uh, s divide Syria, to partition Syria along um, sectarian lines. So they've got uh, Saudi and, and Saudi Arabia and Qatar are not on the same page mm. when it comes to Iran, not completely, uh, nor is the UAE. United Arab Emirates. There's different schools of thought within the Emirates. So what does this mean? There's not the cohesion there. And uh, 200 of the top clerics from around the world met in Grozny last uh, August to, d to talk about what it means to be Sunni. And they did not invite anybody from Saudi Arabia mm. or any of the Wahhabi clerics from Qatar. So they've already you see a split in this kind of, they don't want to foster this radical Wahhabist um, ideology. And so th this, this is the w way the trend is going. Also, the formation of a Muslim NATO. You probably saw this in the news recently. This is falling apart. I think they had a general uh, from Pakistan who was going to be appointed. The rumors are he's just about to jump ship. So, because they don't want to be part of this kind of ideological sectarian uh, NATO, Muslim NATO force that's going to really target Iran. That's that's really what the and U.S. That's the aim. Here. That's the aim. That's yeah. all of this. This Sunni alliance and all this is just about positioning everybody towards Iran. Egypt is not on board. Well, Syria is not on board. There's the two last secular Arab uh, uh, democratic nation states uh, in the nationalist Arab nationalist nation states. They're not on board. What do you have left? Mm. Monarchies. And sectarian monarchies, Bahrain is a majority uh, Shia country. They're going to have problems supporting uh, this kind of effort as well internally. It's, the whole thing is basically coming apart at the seams for Saudi Arabia. So the U.S. is trying to shore that up with this big impressive meeting. But as uh, Sharmin Narwani has said in this brilliant article, it, this, uh, this facade, this, it, it's really coming apart. Mm -hmm. There is no cohesion. There is no Sunni cohesion really beyond the sectarian agenda. There's no real ideological uh, glue holding this thing together either. Yeah. Okay, uh, we'll move on. Uh, just a couple of quick ads and a reminder of the uh, mortgage compensation seminar taking place on the 8th of June. Uh, get Anthony Carlin speaking at that. It's at the Five Ways in Birmingham. Uh, you can find out a bit more about that at sim events, cymevents.co.uk. Uh, and uh, the media goes on trial in Froome on the 11th of June, 7 p.m. in the Cheese and Grain in Froome. Uh, you're speaking, Vanessa, and uh, several other people, including Peter Ford, uh, the former UK ambassador to, uh, to uh, Syria. And ticket sales are doing very well, by the way. Okay. Uh, I've just uh, heard from the organiser, so it looks like it's going to be a great event. Okay, fantastic. Um, right, David, uh, over to you, because uh, Artists here, we, we talked about this uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, just uh, remind everybody uh, what this story is about uh, and and then bring us up to date. And we've got Abby uh, waiting in the wings to, to help with that. Yes, this is um, the fight for um, the fight by a small Highland community uh, against the planning um, uh, decision and against the development that is uh, very adversely affecting that community and uh, against a, a local authority who seem to be not playing by the rules. Um, a decision was made to host a very large extension to a sewage treatment works in Ardesia uh, to construct pipelines through the town. And it would appear that the decision to, uh, 
to 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 go this particular route um, was was made behind closed doors and in advance of the public process. And the public process seems to be very uh, corrupted um, in numerous ways. So the community are fighting back and they're starting to ask questions and they're, they have uh, the developer and they have the local authority very much struggling to come up with answers. So it's, it's in this area that we want to have a, a brief update today from Abbey. And uh, the first uh, item to, to talk about is a controversy regarding uh, what is known locally as the Bund. And we have a photograph of it with the, uh, uh, the, the waters of the uh, Murray Firth beating against it. Um, so, Abby, tell us about the Bund. What is it? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having us on again to discuss our little community. Um, the Bund um, back straight onto the houses, as you can see in the photo there. Um, and there's been kind of a bit of controversy as to, we, we all know it's a flood defence. You know, it's there for a reason. You can see how close it is to the houses there. Um, but Scottish Water and the Highland Council have tried to refuse that, you know, it's absolutely not a flood defence. Um, Scottish, even even the uh, who owns the Bund um, has been an issue. Scottish Water told the Highland Council that Murray Estates owned the whole Bund. Um, and Andrew Harrod, the managing director of Murray Estates, have said, no, they only own so much. Um, so even that, you know, that is kind of an issue. Um, the Bund does act as a flood defence. We've now heard from SNH who are saying that it is a flood embankment. Um, you know, that is a, is a major thing because it would not have been permitted development. They wouldn't have just been able to, you know, do it under permitted development. They would have needed planning permission to lay the pipeline there. So the so the works to lay the pipeline have have damaged the bund have have compromised it is that, yeah, is that what's I mean, happened? Yeah, I mean, said they were going to shave the bund, which is not what's happened. They've taken out um, nearly half of it, and they've actually had to prop it up. Now, from when we've gone down and we've had a look, you know, they've they've changed the structural integrity of the bund as well. It's now kind of the same shape that it was before, but they took a lot of rocks out of it and they've replaced it with a lot of soft soil. So you know. There's no, ins you know, we as of just now don't know whether they've got any insurance for what they've done. So if there was a breach of the bund, how would the people whose houses back onto it, how would they be affected? Who would pay for that? So these are all issues that are very serious for the people in the community. So they've, they've taken away 50% of the bund, which is, as, as we can see from the photograph, clearly uh, a vital sea defence. Absolutely. And this and this has been done on a sort of permitted development rules that would allow you to lay a pipe up a high street or something like that. That's absolutely yeah yeah that's what they've done. Um, it's clearly not that. I mean, the community said from day one, you know, it's clearly a flood defence. It you know the waves do come over the bund. You know, there's gardens and houses right behind the bund. Um, you know, if it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck. You know, um, it's definitely you know. It's definitely a flood embankment and it is used as that. So then, you know, they said they were just going to scrape it. That is not what they did. They had to actually prop it up because it was collapsing um, as they did, as they actually put the um, the things in to kind of shore it up. It was collapsing in on the workmen. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 been a bit of a serious issue um, for us. So Highland Council have said it's 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 um, not to see defence, even though it kind of is, and they're trying to um, walk that line. Have they said anything about the integrity of it? The have they have they answered any of your questions on um, the threat this poses to the safety of your homes? Absolutely not. No, I'm um, actually when asked by a resident that lives right next to the bund, um, they were obviously there as they were putting in the pipeline and as it was collapsing. Um, and there was lots of men kind of screaming and, oh no, it's collapsing. And the, you know, there was loads of blokes there from Scottish Water who weren't happy and shouting at the workmen as to who's doing what and quick fix it. And the Highland Council we know came down and we got told by some of the workers they were not happy with the state of the bund. But when you ask the Highland Council, it appears that they were absolutely fine with what's going on and they're not worried at all. Um, yeah, lack, so <laughs> lack, of, lack of transparency, lack of clarity again. Um, okay. and, and 
you've also uh, I understand heard evidence that the the basic planning process um, was not followed correctly. Could you talk us through that, please? Yeah, sure. Again, um, so this is to do with an unlawful extension that um, the Highland Council granted Scottish Water in 2014. Um, I have actually just put in a complaint with the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman um, regarding this issue. Um, so basically, the Highland Council advertised it in the local paper on the 17th of January 2014. And it said that if they had, it was open for, for 14 days for comments. And they granted the extension on the 23rd of January. So they granted the extension before the comment date was over. Um, so again, it shows that the community is not get, getting any chance to comment. They're not listening to comments and it's unlawful. Yes. And, and just to close, could you give us a little outline? Because you, you've been using, I know, the Freedom of Information Act to try and obtain information. Um, how has that been going? Yeah, sometimes the Freedom of Information Act is absolutely brilliant, you know, depending who you approach for information. We have a couple of bodies that seem to respond within the days um, that they're meant to. And then we have like the Highland Council or Scottish Water who tend to drag it out for as long as possible. And, um, you know, you might know they have a certain document um, and then when you get it sent through, you know, there's missing pages and you know, so um, the freedom of information for us has been really good because we find out a lot of information. They've had to give us certain things. But I also think that depending who you ask, they can they can take out the information that you know they've got as well. Yeah, we're, we're finding that. We're finding that there's, an, there's a tendency to extend the period um, and to try and resist issuing information on, on quite spurious grounds sometimes. Well, well, we'll David, David sorry, we, we are going to come on to that right now. But just before we do, am I being overly conspiratorial when I mention the colours of Highland Co uh, Council's uh, letterhead? <laughs> do you <laughs> see a certain common purpose theme there? I, I don't know. Uh, I think that's an outrageous conspiracy theory that I'm sure that uh, the Highland Council is composed of only uh, no uh, common purpose graduates at all. Yeah. Well, look, uh, thank you very much, Abby. We'll, we'll keep up. We'll keep up with this uh, as, as uh, events transpire. But let's come on to this issue of freedom of information. Uh, and uh, an open letter, David, has been uh, written by a, a number of journalists uh, uh, on this issue. And let's just have a look at some of the things that they say. Uh, we're a group of newspaper, online and broadcast journalists uh, who routinely use freedom of information legislation in our reporting and research. And we're writing to you to raise live concerns we have about the current practice and experience trying to use that legislation, particularly with respect to the Scottish government and its agencies. Uh, they say we've recent examples of one information request being repeatedly delayed significantly beyond the 20 working day deadline without clear justification or warning. Two, emails asking for an update on answering requests in cases of delays beyond the legal deadline being routinely ignored by officials. Uh, three, officials delaying responses for so long that initial requests only get answered under internal review, making it impossible for journalists to ask for incomplete replies to be internally reviewed again. This leaves them facing further longer delays by appealing to the Scottish Information Commissioner. Four, Scottish government officials taking control of requests to other government agencies without the consent of the applicant. Five, requests being blocked or refused for tenuous reasons. Six, requests being screened for potential political damage by special advisors and of response to individual journalists being routinely handled by special advisors. And David, uh, you know, this is, this is not in, uncommon in, on, in England as well, in England and Wales. Uh, we're constantly having this problem uh, here at the column, uh, constantly having to go to the information commissioner who uh, generally isn't that helpful. Uh, but uh, this particular letter focusing on Scotland, but it's a broader issue, isn't it? It is, and there's a further broader issue here, and it's, it's covered in the BBC report on this. It's, it says that the journalists um, accuse the government of failing to keep records of information that should be available. Um, now, we are find, finding this. Uh, you start asking questions about major public consultations, um, fact-finding, um, testing public opinion, and you know, major government initiatives, for example, in the name person. And the answer is, well, there are no records. And and you find information that points to meetings having taken place. So you say, well, you can give them the date of the meeting and say, can we have the record of that? No record exists. 
We then found that these were part of, these were discussions within larger governmental meetings involving government and numerous third sector um, players, NSPCC, these sorts of people. Uh, so we asked for the, for the minutes of the larger meeting and we're again told that no minutes exist. So what we're seeing, if this is true, is that very substantial parts of government business is being done in secret with no minutes, no records, behind closed doors and not, um, not available for public scrutiny. Um, well, uh, and I have a I have a freedom of information request in at the moment where I've just been told uh, that it's on the 20 day limit. I've just been told that they do hold the information, uh, but they need another 20 days uh, to decide how they can avoid giving it to me. Um, so, so that's pretty much where we, we're at. We get that a lot as well. Um, when we get these, what we've now been told by the Information Commissioner, people might want to know this, um, is that when you get the letter of a delay, immediately appeal for an internal review right away on, on the on the 21 days as soon as the 21 days is up you appeal right away for an internal review that often jolts the information free in a magical fashion but if it doesn't it gets you further along the line for going to the information commissioner which is ultimately uh, the, the best weapon we have uh, yes that's that's not bad advice now um let's move on now, you've been wanting to cover this issue of the increase in uh, shall we say, violence in, in politics. Is don't, not sure whether violence is quite the right word uh, for quite a number of weeks now, but it's kind of come to a head this week, David, because uh, you were running a couple of events uh, to promote to, with Gilad Atzman. Um, and uh, the event in Edinburgh, day before yesterday, was it? Uh, didn't quite go to plan. I've just got a few seconds of Gilad's uh, video report of this, so, so we'll play that and then... Uh, and then perhaps you could comment on it. Uh, sorry. These two innocent looking kids actually attacked me yesterday in Edinburgh. They were joined by a third guy. You can probably see his footage from the back. Um, I'm happy to tell you that uh, I'm totally okay. I survived uh, an attack <laughs> by the Antifa. Yet I have a lot of questions to ask. So uh, Gillard has a lot of questions to ask. We have a lot of questions to ask. Um, first of all, what was the nature of the attack? And, and just tell us a little bit about the people that were involved. Well, there was three, three people. Two of them came up. Uh, we were standing outside the, the bookshop, which is uh, called Lighthouse, which is, uh, bills itself as a radical bookshop. And we had been originally planning to, make the, to do the talk in there. Um, but we were banned from that on the account that we were too radical that um, and it's quite difficult to pin down what the reasons are, but Gillard was too controversial or his views were somehow um, too challenging. And then, and then it became hate speech and then it became all sorts of things. So that clearly people were, were putting in some sort of complaint or some sort of campaign to the owner of this bookshop who was folding like a pack of cards. Um, the, the blog post cancelling the event put up by the by the bookshop, very strangely, suggested that people should be joining Edinburgh Antifa, which is, of course, a, a, a street violence movement. And that seemed for a, for a bookshop which advertises itself as, as supporting ideas and the exchange, of, the exchange of fresh ideas and new thinking, seemed a very strange position. So we met outside the bookshop. Uh, these two lads came up and, and they seemed to be coming along to the event. So we directed most of the audience down to the, the, the alternative venue. And we hung around to see if anyone else would, would, would turn up not knowing about the change of venue so we could direct them. We were walking down towards the new venue, which was only a few hundred yards away. And most of us were carrying equipment, carrying books, this sort of thing. And, and then all of a sudden, um, it, things turned violent. One of the, one of the, the, the chaps started yelling obscenities and, and the other two... Um, seemed to uh, make some sort of attempt to, 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 to steal equipment. Um, one um, I, I punched Gillard in the head from behind. 
and uh, they tried to wrestle bags of books and saxophone etc away from them uh, and one of the other uh, people carrying the equipment down was also attacked and then very very quickly I mean within a few seconds they then ran off down the street so it was all over quite quickly fortunately no one was seriously hurt but what it is is an attempt using violence to silence opinion that these people think is not just something they disagree with, but something that should be forcibly suppressed by violent means. And uh, anybody who holds these views, and remember we're talking about views such as history should be open for re-examination in a scholarly fashion. Uh, we're talking about um, we should be able to debate with one another and exchange ideas and test ideas in an open um, in an open manner without intimidation. These are the sort of ideas we're trying to silence. Um, if you hold these ideas, if you hold the ideas that used to be the defining characteristic of Western culture, then uh, you are now uh, a target for street violence. Any thoughts? Uh, no, I, it's interesting. It's ironic that the anti-fascist uh, movement, or Antifa as it's called, uh, are some of the biggest uh, street fascists around these days. Uh, well, it's not ironic. It's, um, it's, it's predictable if you actually follow their exploits. Uh, so who, who's behind these groups, Mike? Who's pulling the strings of these kids? Uh, who's pushing them out there? Which political uh, uh, people are uh, behind the scenes uh, using them? Uh, David, these are, David, sorry, these, David. Are, the, these David. are, of course, the issues that, that Gillard is talking about in his new book. Um, his, his new book, which is called Being in Time, and we'll do a bit of advertising here, Being in Time, a Post-Political Manifesto, right, talks about where the current dystopian political situation has come from. It talks about many, many things that have happened over the past um, 50 to 100 years um, about movements and ideas that have taken over the West and taken over particularly academia. And it talks about the harm and, and uh, that, that these ideas are doing and the dystopia that they generate. So this is it's understandable why these people would want to silence Gilad Atzman. Um, it's less understandable why so many people seem so easily fooled into, into buying um, this postmodern view of the world in which uh, there is no right and wrong, nothing matters, and violence for uh, ideological ends is um, viewed as a good thing. Um, well, you've uh, written about this. Uh, the t headline is Evil Stirs. It's not published yet on the UK Column website. It, we, I think we have about half a dozen typos to fix. Um, and because, you know, we don't want to be accused of being fake news, a fake news site, Patrick, because we, one of the signs of fake news sites is that you've got typos in your articles. Mm. Uh, Daily Mail should take note of that, I yeah, think. In all caps in your uh, yeah, in your headlines. In your yeah, headlines yeah. 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 But uh, uh, that will be uh, published uh, within about 10 minutes of this program being finished. Um, so just uh, briefly, David, on that one. Well, it looks at uh, briefly what happened because there was events in Newcastle as well of a similar, not violent, but certainly aggressive nature. Um, and it uh, it covers, uh, it includes two embedded videos from Gillard Artsman, which describe uh, the events as he sees them uh, and a commentary from me um, looking at what's been going on here and uh, the importance of uh, standing with people like Gillard Artsman who are prepared to stand up and uh, ask questions, and refine the questions, and insist upon uh, living in a society where that um, remains possible. Um, and uh, this sort of threats and violence seem to be appearing in the mainstream politics as well in Scotland. So uh, you're not welcome. Stur Sturgeon challenged over threats made by SNP activists to Tories. Uh, and is, is, this, is this the uh, SNP activist that, that we're talking about here? This is the SNP activist concerned. Yes, this was in the uh, mining, former mining town of Curry. The mine's been closed for many years. It does have uh, a large industrial plant on that site. Um, and what happened was this, this lady was going along in her van and spotted the Tory uh, canvassers and decided to harass them uh, from her moving vehicle. Um, shouting amongst other things to go back to England or, or leave the country because you're not welcome. So these obviously these are Scots with different opinions. So if you have the wrong opinions in Scotland, you're told to leave. It's something that most of us 
who have um, held up the, the flag of liberty in some some fashion or other in social media are are quite familiar with. You're told at some point uh, to leave the country. But of course, it's our country and why should we go anywhere? This is the sort of intolerance that's becoming very much characteristic of the left at the moment in Scottish politics. It's very unpleasant. And uh, this, this woman's felt confident enough in this behavior uh, to stream it live from her moving vehicle. And I understand that uh, Police Scotland have sent a report to the Procurator Fiscal and the report is going to involve uh, charges of both breach of the peace, which in Scotland, remember, is causing um, fear and alarm, and, uh, and also um, a road traffic offence, uh, as it all happened from a moving vehicle. Um, and this is being called the Battle of Bannockburn? Well, this is this was the headline, but it, it was it was in or near the Bannockburn constituency. Um, but it's it's a point that we've made several times in articles in the column uh, that Scottish nationalism is not nationalism. These are people um, abusing and, and encouraging to you know, telling other Scots to leave the country. There's nothing nationalist about it. The uh, what it is is uh, it, is the new left, the extreme left. Um, just the same sort of ideas that, that motivate Antifa. It may be a slightly less um, op openly aggressive manner, but only marginally. Um, it's internationalist. It's not nationalist. And it's extremely intolerant of other ideas. And the test here is not what nationality are you. The test here is an even more insidious one. It's just how do you think? And if you answer that one wrongly, you're in trouble. Um Thank you for that. So we're just going to end on this one then, because uh, I thought this was uh, quite appropriate under the circumstances. Why is Britain so disenchanted with its politicians? This is in the Financial Times and it's by Matthew Engel. Uh, and uh, I have to say, uh, the mainstream media continues to be, Patrick, in complete denial here. Uh, let's just have a look at some of the things that he, that he says. And sometimes one can just sniff a mood it seems to me, having spoken to dozens of voters in Wolverhampton and Bridgend, areas containing four vulnerable Labour held seats, that the essential thesis behind Theresa May's decision to call the election has not yet disappeared. There are enough Labour voters who are sufficiently put off by the party's left wing leader, Jeremy Corbyn, to give May the increased majority she, cra she craves. The canvas uh, returns of both parties back this up. He, they go on to say British democracy has a vibrancy that the world might envy. But if two-fifths of eligible voters see no reason uh, why any of it matters, then it is vital that after Thursday the politicians must stop arguing or, in the Prime Minister's case, refusing to argue and quietly consider how on earth they can revise the nation's most precious asset, uh, its successful democracy. Uh, at no point in this article did anybody discuss uh, lies, deceit, fake news, uh, the kind of behaviour that we've seen from politicians over the last several years, the, the unlawful drive to, to war after war, um, there's, none of this is mentioned. It's, it's uh, all about sort of basic disillusionment with, with some of the things. You know, there's really no substance to the article, no recognition of the reality of the situation. So their call to action there, which is that uh, politicians have to get together after next Thursday and sort it out, is wishful thinking, Mike. Yes. Because if you're not dealing with the causes of the uh, problem or the causes of the illness, as it were, and the, just the symptoms and things like this, th this is the cul-de-sac that the mainstream media, the Financial Times, the Times, the Gar everybody takes us down the same cul-de-sac for any big issue. And this is why it will never be resolved. And this is why the media, the word media means medium. This is the person between the real world and the people. Mm. And when the media or the medium is uh, so corrupt and filtering things to such a degree that they're obfuscating the real fundamental questions, then they themselves are, are guilty of uh, you know, the worst failure. Um, you know, why are they there? Yeah, David, two seconds on this one. And the other issue is, of course, that more and more power is is being um, gathered up by the government and less and less has been left for the people. And as the people realise this, they're losing any sort of uh, connection with the government. The, the solution would be, of course, to reverse that process and make us genuinely more equal, more equal between those in power and those just trying to live their lives. And that means giving more authority 
to individual men and women and individual families and individual communities and less to a centralising and all-powerful state. Uh, Mark, I'm amazed you're still here. Thank you very much for sticking around. Uh, have you got any thoughts just to close the show on that? Absolutely. I wanted to mention that the global cities thing you guys mentioned, the world parliament and mayors, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs is following right after Bilderberg, June 7 through 9 with their second global cities forum. I covered it last year in Chicago. So they're right on cue with this devolution thing where the cities are trying to basically depart the nation state and run things in their own grid. So we have this partner of Bilderberg, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, which is the Chicago version of Chatham House, uh, right on time, right on cue doing that. And I just wanted to mention that I hadn't seen this, but Wilbur Ross, Trump's Commerce Secretary, is at Bilderberg this year, as well as National Security Chief McMaster, as well as Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, and another newcomer, not Lindsey Graham, he was in Bilderberg last year, but another newcomer, Tom Cotton, the neocon Arkansas senator. So we have more currently serving U.S. officials at Bilderberg this year during the Trump administration, far more than compared to the last several years. Okay, brilliant. Have you got any? No, I think those great, are the important points. That's yeah. a great point Mark made there that uh, in, in the Trump administration, which is meant to be anti-globalist and uh, uh, anti-New World Order, et cetera, yeah. according to his supporters, they've got more serving people within the administration there than in, in previous years. That just speaks volumes. Okay. Well, look, thank you very much to Mark Anderson for joining us, for David Scott, as usual, on a Friday, and for Abby Reardon. Uh, thank you very, very much for watching. We will be back at the same time, 1 p.m. on Monday lunchtime. We will see you then. Thanks. Bye-bye.